up anymore. They've got speeches that will just hopefully blow your minds and open them, um, and it'll be fantastic. So I want to introduce our first speaker, who's actually a faculty member, um, one, of, one of the most esteemed faculty members here at Tufts University. Um, she is a professor in the Department of Child Development. She's also the director of the um, Center for Language and Reading Research here at Tufts. Um, and she is an expert on the neurological <laughs> underpinnings of uh, reading, language, and uh, developmental dyslexia. So she studies this, and when I say expert, you might be thinking like, oh, she's an expert. <laughs> on Sunday, on Sunday, my friends, she, her research was featured in a Washington Post article, and when she came in today, she said, oh, I'm so, I'm exhausted from a BBC interview, an interview with NPR. This woman knows what she's talking about. I would like to please welcome, with open arms, Professor Marianne Wolf. <laughs> this and thank all of you old friends, new friends, and Jonathan, my friend from town law. Um, we're going to have a kind of a whirlwind trip through some research that is indeed thinking beyond boundaries and working across borders. And so for 10 minutes, that's all I have of you, I'm going to introduce you to a partnership that also goes across borders. Um, the Center for Reading and Language Research, we're working with the MIT Media Lab, Georgia State University, and we're also working with the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values, and you'll hear just a little bit about that in a few minutes. But basically, we are after an enormous problem. I work in the Child Development Department, I work across <coughs> disciplines, but all of us are working on one universal issue, and that is literacy. For most of you, you take it completely for granted. You think reading is a natural thing. It, it could not be more unnatural. The reading brain is plastic, if I could use yours. We make circuits of both hemispheres. We do extraordinary things. But mostly, it is a platform for releasing the potential of children to learn beyond their own, whatever their backgrounds are. It is a platform for our own best thought. Yet. 72 million children in this world are not only not literate, they will never ever have an opportunity. They will have no school. They will have no teacher. Another 100 million children have schools in which there are approximately 60 to 100 children in a classroom. They will also never have a chance really to become totally literate. Um, there are almost 800 million people in the world in this in this place, and two-thirds of them are women, which is a part of the story I wish I could tell you more of today, but I can't. I am part of a very small group of people. All of us here can do different things with our knowledge base. This very small group of people want to create an open source platform which in a few years provides evidence for the success or the failure of what if, however, we are successful, we aim to reach millions and millions of children. We hope even 100 million, beyond our group's efforts, 100 million children. And if we can, we will reduce the world's poverty by 12%. There's so many other issues involved in all of this, but I only have the one moment with you. So I want to talk to you about what we've done very quickly across intellectual borders. This is a moment when technology has made aspects of, of mobile educational possibilities different from any other moment. It is affordable. We have big data analytics in which we can do tetrabytes of, of data all from, just from all parts of the world and be able to analyze it. We're involved in child-driven learning. We at Tufts are involved in translating our understanding of what the reading brain is and translating that into a curation of apps and educational experiences with this question in mind. Can we develop a theoretically based digital experience for mobile devices that enables children to learn to read on their own with no teacher, no school, no other intervention at all? These are two of our boys in Ethiopia. Now what we're doing 
We're taking our knowledge from the cognitive neural, neural sciences. We're using our very knowledge of how the brain learns to read as the basis for the choice of our apps or as is our, our absolute desire in the next year and a half to design apps that will in fact address all these different areas of the reading brain circuit. We are taking it to very remote places of the world. But the idea is, can we take child-driven learning, reading brain curated apps and experiences, and be able ultimately to capture the data on a kind of a, a, a mentoring system so that ultimately we will know where the child is, what are they learning, what are they not learning, do they, what else do they need, so that we will ultimately be able to tailor and address the individual needs of children. We're not there yet, but this is the beginning, and we want to show you where we are. We've taken it in the beginning to two of the most remote places in Ethiopia you can imagine. When, when people say off the radar, you can't even use that phrase. There is no electricity, no water, no sanitation. They have never seen paper, much less a digital tablet, which is what we're bringing. And yet, I want to show you what has happened when we have looked at these two villages, the children 4 to 11, and what happens. vocabulary beyond our wildest dreams. They have begun the precursors of literacy. We never believed we could get this far. But this is what we call the Helen Keller moment. We have to help them go over that cusp into full literacy. We're not there yet. We've just been given wonderful news about funding that will enable us to work on this for at least two more years. But we're at this moment when we are building an open source platform that could be used by researchers in technology and around the world ultimately. Because what we want is a true open source platform where people, not just where we are in Ethiopia, we are already begun, have begun in South Africa, in Uganda, in Bangladesh, and through the venerable Tins and Priya Darshi at the Dalai Lama Center, we're entering our first two deployments in India. What we want to do is begin to make templates for people in different languages and use it as a way not just to share knowledge and we hope build literacy, but also break down barriers about who is other. Because one of the most important things that we want to do is use this open platform as a platform for other people to contribute to and for other forms of literacy, numeracy, health and nutrition, and ethics. The last thing I'll say to you today. So I'm on sabbatical next year. And one of the things I most want to do is try to understand how we can take our early apps, which are designed, you know, linguistics and neuroscience, all of this is designed to help us teach children to teach themselves to read. But what if we could use these very early stories to break down our sense of who other is, to build up a sense of empathy and compassion among children. And therefore, one of the next things that we do in our work, if we can just move into this next moment of literacy, is to introduce story after story, first that we write, then that they write, then that they tell about who other is, so that one piece of our work is literally to break down who other is in the life of the next generation. So I want to end my talk with a look at the future. This is my colleague who will be going there in June, Stephanie Gottfeld, and that's a class of 100 children and one teacher and three of the kids 
our babies who are left off every morning. This is part of our reality, and this is something I invite all of you to think about. We can all contribute because we want no others out there. We want a connected world. Thank you so much. I want to tell you all something very special because Professor Wolf, I emailed her a while ago and, and we asked her, we said, Professor Wolf, would you, would, would you do us the honor of speaking at our event? And she was very excited. She said, absolutely, I'd love to. And she told us that with the one condition, she had to go first because she's flying out of town very, very soon from this moment right now. So she agreed to be here despite the fact that she's going to be on a plane in very few hours. So we'd like to give this to you as a thank you. Thank you very much again, Professor Wolf. Can we thank her again, everyone, please? All right. All right, well, that was very inspirational.